Okay, well, I don't know where these guys are, man. Let's just do it, all right? Okay, sounds fine to me. All right, hang on just a sec here. Hi, everybody. I'm Al Bernstein, Showtime Boxing Analyst, and I listen to the Ringside Boxing Show. Live from Monterey on California's beautiful Central Coast, this is the Ringside Boxing Show. I'm Dennis Taylor welcoming you to join me and my expert analysts, Travis Hartman, Rizwan Zahid, and John J. Responsi today and every week for the hottest, sweatiest show on the West Coast. And now, from Studio 1A, it's the Ringside Boxing Show. Welcome to the Ringside Boxing Show on the Grueling Truth Sports Network. I'm Dennis Taylor, and in just a few minutes, John J. Responsi and I are going to be talking to one of the greatest fighters who ever lived. Michael Carbajal, Little Hands of Stone, won six world title belts, all in the 108-pound division in a career that spanned from 1989 to 1999 and included 20 world title fights. He is a member of the International Boxing Hall of Fame, the World Boxing Hall of Fame, the Nevada Boxing Hall of Fame, and the California Boxing Hall of Fame. He was the ring, in, in the Ring Magazine's Fight of the Year in 1993. He was the Comeback Fighter of the Year in 1999. When, get this, he, he took the, the world title away from 20-year-old Jorge Arce that night, and then he walked away. He retired at the, at the very top of the mountain right before his 32nd birthday. Um, Michael will be joining wow. us uh, for an in-depth interview about his career very shortly, and trust me, you're going to want to hang around for this one. Uh, right now, uh, we want to catch up with some current events uh, with our expert analyst, Travis Hartman, is a professional boxer, trainer, and promoter from Osborne, Missouri. He's now living and training in Orlando, Florida. Rizwan Zahid is a boxing journalist from Toronto. And we're hoping to be joined also by uh, the fight lawyer, Danny Saratelli, who's a New York uh, boxing trainer and attorney who is always, uh, has plenty to say about the boxing game. Uh, sitting in with uh, Responsi today, who couldn't be with us for today's opening segment. And uh, we got, uh, we've got Danny and Travis with us right now, uh, and still waiting on Rizwan, not sure where he is. But, uh, hey, guys, how you doing? Hey, Dennis, how are you? Doing good, man, doing good. Um, so, uh, hey, Travis, your, your Facebook friends already know about this, but you fought six rounds on Friday night against the 19th undefeated opponent of your career, Kent Cruz, who's a 26-year-old welterweight from St. Louis. He came away with the unanimous decision but uh, anybody who goes to your Facebook page can can uh, see that you gave him a competitive fight. Um, how did you feel, and what kind of grade grade did you give yourself afterwards? I mean, I I feel I feel really good, so I give myself an A for my overall condition. But um, I can't give myself a, a very good grade though because I ended up losing, so I can't give myself that great of a grade. But from where I was at last year to where I'm at right now, and you know, I haven't fought since last April, and, you know, the first fight that I chose to fight on my comeback trail, you know, was an undefeated kid, you know, 15-0 and 0 now. <laughs> so that's just kind of been the story of my life, Dennis, and you know that, my boxing career, at least. I've yep. always chose to fight the best out there, and I've never, you know, never thought to dodge anybody, and I just, I never like to fight the lesser competition to build my way up. I just want to go right for it, and that's just how I've always been, and I'm going to continue that way. And I mean, if you watch the fight, you obviously there's there's moments in that fight where you can tell that if I just did a li- just a little bit more, let my hands go just a little bit more, that I can pull away and I can win one of these fights. So this is my last year. That 2019 will 100% be my last year. You won't see me fight in 2020. And I think that last night, I think it showed that you know I laid it out there. I gave it everything that I had. Um, like I said, though, there was a couple moments to where my timing was off. So that's why I, you could tell I didn't let my hand go as much. I did let him go a little bit, but I did. I felt hesitant in moments because I didn't have that. I really didn't work with a coach one-on-one for this training camp. I was just kind of bouncing around and getting sparring all over Florida. I was doing conditioning. I even came back to Missouri, and I did uh, I finished up my conditioning there. But I never got a chance to really work on uh, one-on-one stuff with, with my coach, which is my dad as well. And I think it showed in the fight, meaning that you didn't see me rip off too many uh, combinations. You know, it was more of real quick jabs, quick counters. Um, so now I'm going to go back to the drawing board. I'm going to I'm going to work on letting my hands go a little more. Um, but Dennis, like I said, if anybody wants to watch the fight, you know, they're more welcome to. I put up a hell of a fight. 
Um, I was right there in that fight the whole time. You know, I had a little bit of a, a ref against me, just a little bit, but there's no excuses, you know. Referees are human just like we are, and so are the judges. And I went out there and did my best, and all I know is that I, I really, gen- genuinely, Dennis, I feel great. My body, I'm not as sore as I used to be after fights, which means to tell me that I haven't been training like I should have been, and I'm 35 now, and that's crazy that I'm coming to that conclusion <laughs> as 35 <laughs> and 15 years pro. But I really feel healthy. I feel my body is it's coming around, and I took a different approach to this fight, and I really think it showed. And I'm going to try to build on that momentum. Um, it's going to be tough because people are going to see that fight, and they're also going to see my record. And not a lot of people are going to want to fight me because they're going to realize that I can fight, even though my record's bad now. They're going to realize I can fight, especially when I'm in shape. So it is going to be hard for me to fight some more top guys. Uh, but I, I really hope that I, I get some, and I hope that these fighters and promoters do the right thing and give me, you know, four or five, six weeks of training before I fight them because I can compete with the best in the world, and I think it's I've shown them most of my career, and especially my last fight. You know, uh, people who've listened to this show over the years um, know some of the guys that you've that you fought in your career, but mm-hmm. go ahead and run through them again. <laughs> oh my gosh! Uh, yeah, I mean Jorge Paez Jr., Chavez Jr., Keith Thurman, uh, Terrence Crawford, Jesse Vargas. I mean that's just a list of uh, you know the really really top top guys. But I mean there's just there's there's a whole slew of Dennis as you know. You know he goes through my list and look, and I fought most of those guys on under five days notice. You know my most of my career because nobody really wanted to give me you know more than that to train. But now. I'm doing the smart thing, Dennis. I really am. You know, I'm, I stopped taking fights. The whole 2019, I'm not going to take short notice fights. I'm going to only take fights that they allow me to train for. And now I'm just going to stay in shape. That's the whole deal. And, and that's where I have to go because they are going to call me on short notice. But now that I've got this, this fight under my belt, I just got to continue being in the same shape that I was for this fight. And that's what I'm going to do, Dennis. And, you know, the, the ringside, ringside boxing nation has my work there. And, you know, my dad has my word there where I'm just going to continue this this journey that I'm on. And, you know, I don't want to get too godly, but I, I'm going to a little bit that God's allow me to go on this, you know, this finishing out my career on this journey. And I'm going to give it my best. And I'm going to give it my best because the sport of boxing also deserves that. And and I have the God-given talent I always have. I just have to work a little harder. And, and that's what I'm doing, Dennis. Outstanding, man. Well, hey, Danny, man, thanks for, thanks for uh, sitting in for John today. How are you? No problem. Pretty good. How are you doing, Dennis? Doing good. Doing good. Did you get any rest last night? Uh, very little. But uh, <laughs> I didn't know Travis fought. I'm just checking out the computer now. I'm a little behind on everything. Uh, how you doing, Travis? I'm doing pretty good, man. Good, good. good. All right. So, hey, guys, uh, let's talk about a couple couple of fights that happened Saturday on, on British soil. And, uh, Danny, I'll throw this first one to you. Um, th- there was a heavyweight fight that was supposed to be a stern test for an up-and-comer in, in that division, Joe Joyce, who's uh, 33 years old, but he's a young guy in, in the heavyweight division, um, just experience-wise. His opponent, uh, Bourbon Stavern, showed up weighing 277 pounds and uh, didn't make it out of the sixth round. And Joyce drops Stavern in the third round and then buzzed him with a left hook with about 50 seconds to go in the sixth and hammered him with a couple of rights and uh, the refs stepped in and stopped it. Danny, I was going to make a joke that Stavern apparently trained at Dunkin' Donuts, but, but <laughs> you, you, uh, you, you sent me a text uh, earlier today that uh, um, you think we should cut him some slack as a 40, 40-year-old heavyweight. So I'll let you defend him on that point. Um, and, and Joe Joyce, uh, meanwhile, he, he's six foot six, 265, got a silver medal at, at 2016 uh, Summer Olympics, where he lost the gold medal match by a split decision to Tony Yoka. Um, Danny, this guy's big, and he's strong, and he's got the amateur pedigree, and he's now 8-0, all knockouts. Um, so my other question to you is, is, is he impressive to you? Is this a guy who's likely to become a serious player in the heavyweight division in, in the next, say, year and a half? Uh, I'll tell you, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I caught the fight last night. I didn't get a really close. I, I was, to be honest, I wasn't uh, really able to tune in and pay attention. I was uh, preoccupied uh, somewhere, obviously. <laughs> I, I told you the story. I don't want to yep, be okay. But <laughs> I, I know I saw Joyce before. He fought a friend of mine, Joe Hanks, 
in his last fight, and and Hanks didn't really look like he he got warmed up. He got caught, and uh, you know, a guy that big, if he catches you, uh, he's gonna hurt. You know, he, he could hurt anybody. I'm sure. I thought what was telling, I'd like to hear Travis's take on it, was um, in it, when he got interviewed after the fight last night, he started talking about his sparring with all these guys other than uh, Wilder. And it seemed like, I, I don't know, it just was weird. I don't hear guys really trying to hype themselves up talking about sparring with a few guys in the gym that often uh, on that level. He only has eight fights. So the heavyweight division, though, there's, I don't think there's any depth to it right now, to be honest. So Vern, if he would have trained, he looked like he could have put up, you know, he put would have gave him a lot better of a fight. Uh, and the thing I said about the heavyweights with the weight is you can't tell because sometimes guys are in great shape and they look terrible. I was thinking of the the Polish kid. He always looks terrible and he always comes to fight and in shape. I can't think of his name right now. Uh, if you could help me out with that. Fashion, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, I was curious what Travis was thinking on that one. Yeah, yeah. I, go ahead, Travis. I'm, yeah, I'm still just. I mean, I think we're still so early in Joe Joyce's career. I do give, I give them a lot of credit for Joyce because they did decide to take on Stavern and only what his eighth pro fight is Joe yeah. Joyce's right now. So I, yeah. I give the the promotion team a lot of credit for that because Stavern, by all means, I mean Stavern's a tough test. I mean Stavern, I believe was the first guy to go all 12 rounds with Deontay Wilder, and then Deontay rematched him, you know, yeah. and obliterated him, but but yeah. but still, by all means, he's a big guy, he's a, he's a formidable opponent, and it was a big step for Joyce, however, I'm not so sure that Stavern uh, took it that way, maybe Stavern was cashing in on a couple big paychecks there at the very end, and I'm sure he got paid pretty good for Joyce, so it didn't seem to me that we got the Stavern that we thought we were going to get, if that makes I think that fight yeah. last night was more about what Stavern didn't uh, prepare for than really what Joe Joyce is going to be about. And I don't know if we, I don't know if we know Joe Joyce is yet. I've only seen him a couple of times now. He is, he is, he's got the formula to be part of that new super heavyweight division, if you want to say. You know, the six six, the big body, the big fellas. The, the, there's no more six foot. There's no more Tyson and Holyfield type of guys anymore. Yeah. They're just so much bigger yeah. now. And I think that's what Joe Joyce is. He does have that going for him. Um, but yeah. I don't know. To me, he just he, – he better hit really, really, really hard because he's not impressive yet. And I don't want to discredit him a lot, but to me, he's not impressive yet. And being a guy yeah, like Severn in, in only eight fights, I was kind of expecting to be a lot more impressed. But I'm just not. And that's not to say he's not good. It's just to say that – I'm not impressed yet, so they still got some work, I think, to do before they even think about throwing him in the mix with, you know, the elite of that division, which is, you know, Tyson Fury, Anthony Joshua, Deontay Wilder, uh, those types of names, even Luis Ortiz, guys like that, and I don't think yeah. he's, I don't even think he's in the conversation. I don't even think, I think it would be disrespectful to even put him in that conversation with those guys yet. I yeah, agree, but they fight... So, uh, <laughs> eight fights since the run, like you said, about the Dunkin' Donuts training, I mean... Uh, I was just surprised because he looked that bad, because of his weight and because of how he looked. And in the early rounds, I thought he just came in and was, and was trying to catch uh, Joyce with a big shot. He came out like he was mm-hmm. doing some bombs early, and then he kind of just, you know, he couldn't really get off, and he uh, he looked like he, he wasn't ready to, to go, the, you know, the full fight. Like, he, he didn't put mm-hmm. the work in the duel of the rounds. Uh, but I, I agree. Joyce looks, he looks kind of uh, methodical and uh, – I don't know. He he doesn't. You could tell he doesn't have the experience, and I think they would be better off. The, the thing is, the heavyweight division is is not deep at all. You get guys fifty years old now, and who haven't fought in ten years. Like uh, I feel like Oliver McCall or somebody like that. Could, <laughs> like Larry Holmes, if he felt like it, could come back. And other than the top five guys, there's a lot of guys who really you don't know who they are. It's like women's fighting. It's mm-hmm. not that deep. Yep, you know? that's for sure. Riz just just joined us, and, and Riz, I want to ask you about the main event uh, yesterday. This, this one, I got to admit, surprised me. The result did. Um, James DeGale and Chris Eubank Jr., which is a, a grudge match. Um, Eubank decked DeGale twice and won a close decision. Uh, scorecards were 114, 112, 115, 112, and 117, 109. DeGale's 33, and he doesn't move like he used to. But, um, man, he just seemed reluctant to mix it up with Eubank, who always seemed like a waste of talent to me. 
Um, few fighters look worse to me than Chris Eubank did when he fought George Groves last year and won. You know, there, there were two title fights on the line that night, so you know he should have been motivated. I was surprised Eubank was a seven to four favorite among the bookmakers for that one. Did you see this result coming, Riz? Uh, I think a lot of people questioned heading into the fight how healthy was James DeGale because there's a lot of rumors over the last couple of years of the injuries he's had and, and maybe one of those, then uh, maybe that contributed partially to his loss to Kayla Kruak. So, um, and even in the rematch, he didn't, he didn't really look great either. So he hasn't really looked good in quite a long time. Um, so it's not, it wasn't that surprising that, um, that he lost, but he just looked, you know, he he looked completely out of source. And, uh, you know, the bit I watched in the fight, I just saw him and, you know, he was, he was trying to, for a guy who has as much talent as he, I mean, he's a former gold medalist. He's, you know, he's been around, um, you know, Eubank is still in some ways very, Eubank is big and strong, but he's very tailor made, right? He's, he's, he's guys going to be coming forward and he knows one thing and he's going to be uh relentless pressure. So a guy who's a, uh, a, a notorious boxer with the gold medal, um, you know, for him to just rush in and to stay in the pocket, that just, that told me that something was off. I mean, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't countering. I mean, if the guy was super aggressive, you counter him. That's boxing one-on-one and not at all what DeGale was doing. So he looked, he did not look like he, he belonged. Um, and that, that kind of says something because it's, to me, Eubank didn't blow him out of the water. Eubank didn't look, it's not like anyone looked at Eubank and thought Eubank looked great and he's going to, you know, really test some of the other big super middleweights. I'm not, you know, I, I don't think I can say that yet um, because he, you know, he kind of still look a little wild and reckless. Uh, but, you know, to me, this, this is more telling of DeGale. DeGale doesn't look like he belongs in the ring anymore. You know, at 33, uh, two of the losses were close. The first one, uh, you know, the Truex one and early in his career against, against Groves. Um, but besides that, I mean, he's, you know, he, he beat Lucien Butte in a close fight. He beat Durrell in a very close fight. Um, you know, he got a draw against Badu Jack, and most people thought Badu Jack won that. Um, so he's fought, he, especially lately, he's fought some pretty high-level guys. But um, at this point, if he's getting dropped and, and pretty much outboxed, he's getting outboxed by Eubank, um, that tells me that not everything is there, whether it's injuries or um, – and I think partially – when 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 phys- when when there's physical limitations, I think that's when your mental game can suffer too. And I think for a guy like DeGale, Gale, um, who's 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 well accomplished. I mean, he's been boxing since he was young. Cause he's you know he's had a gold medal and 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 champ numerous times and all that. Um, I think at this point, when you're facing injuries and all that, you have to kind of question how much do you want it. And at this point, I just don't think he wants it. And that's not a criticism. It's it's just I think it's just the fact at this point because. Um, you know, he said, yeah, I've already, you know, I've won the gold medal. I've, I won the BBC title. I've, uh, you know, I was, uh, I was, I was the IBF camp. So if he's already done all these things, the question is, A, is he going to get back to that? And if he's yeah. not going to get back to that, I don't think there's any point in boxing anymore. And I think we've seen from last night, I think he's, he's closer to the latter than he is the former. Travis, what about you, Meg? Does he have a future? I mean, is he a player again? Um... I mean, I think so. I think he can be competitive with with a lot of the fighters out there. He's young. He's athletic. I mean, obviously, he has the fighting gene in him, you know, with his dad uh, being a world champion as well. So, like, it's I, I don't know if he can beat anybody up there, and that's that's just that's where again I'm at, not yeah. to talk. Yeah, and and that's just this, I just don't think I just think he's just limited enough to not win against one of the top guys. Will he have a chance against him? Absolutely, I think he will. He's just He's a confident kid. Um, he can fight. He, he's got skill. He's athletic. Uh, uh, I don't think so. I, I think he's got a really good future ahead of him right now. He's going to be in some exciting fights. I think it's time that they start really stepping up more. Um, and we see him against some more of the elite. And maybe even he comes over to America for a big fight as well. I can kind of see that in the future. But I don't. I just. I don't see him. You know, ruling that division. Uh, not even close, to be honest. But I, he's a, he's for sure a top uh, um, uh, super middleweight in the world for sure. Other than that, I don't think he he has that elite status, Dennis. I just don't. Okay, and we're, we're losing you a little bit. So um, um, either uh, move to a different spot or, uh, or or call us back or something. Um, okay. 
So, uh, Danny, uh, let me switch gears on you uh, right now. There was yeah. an interesting story that popped up on Saturday. Canelo uh, Alvarez says he's open to the idea of going to 175 to fight Sergey Kovalev. This sounds like a stretch to me. Do you think he's serious about that, number one? And do you think he's capable of something like that? Uh, I'll be honest. I didn't hear about it until I talked about it with you, but um, I don't think it makes any sense because uh, – there's a lot more people he could fight and make more money where he's at right now. I mean, I, I don't know about it being serious. I thought that Kovalov, uh, he, he looked better in, in his rematch. I thought it was a good idea getting with Buddy McGurr and Teddy Cruz as his strength and conditioning coach. He did a really good job because I, I got a little nervous in the middle rounds for Kovalov. Uh, he looked like he was mm-hmm. running out of gas. He was getting get caught a little bit here and there, and then he turned it on and looked like he shifted gears, and, and he closed it out strong. So I think the guys in the corner made a big difference. But uh, as far as Canelo, I, I don't know. I mean, it, you know, probably if they negotiated it and, and Kovalov, they made him sweat off a few pounds and something, it probably could be competitive. Maybe, I don't know. I just think it doesn't make any sense at all financially because Ward and Kovalov didn't sell anywhere near what it should have either fight. So I don't know why Canelo mm-hmm. could fight a bum and sell and like sell out the garden or something. I don't know why he would even think about going up and fighting Kovalov unless he knew something was wrong with him and he could easily beat him or something and he was going to get paid. <laughs> okay. All right. So yeah. here's, a, here's a story that popped up Saturday, and I'm going to throw this one to Riz, um, who, whose comment on it was boxing knocks itself out again. Um, and, and this is messy, so, so pay attention. I'm going to try and get this right. Tyson Fury and his promoter, Frank Warren, have a new relationship Uh, supposedly an exclusive relationship with Bob Arum and ESPN. And it seems really possible, at least at first glance, that this has screwed up the rematch between Wilder and Fury, um, which seemed like it was all but done for Showtime pay-per-view in May. Um, Everything seemed full speed ahead until Arum, you know, as he does, brilliantly fought his way into the mix here and got Fury to sign this exclusive TV deal with ESPN. So the problem is that Wilder and his advisor, Al Heyman, are aligned with Showtime and The Zone. Um, there are millions of dollars and, and, and pounds uh, to be made by somebody, but uh, now it seems like it's all a jump ball again. ESPN, Showtime, The Zone, um, you know, they're all back in this cat fight, and it makes me wonder whether we'll see Wilder and Fury in the rematch before they're 40 or 50 years old. Um, meanwhile, mm-hmm. Anthony Joshua is a DAZN Eddie Hearn guy, which makes him compatible, I guess, with Wilder. But since Fury is now exclusive with ESPN, uh, are, are Joshua and Fury and Wilder Fury now unlikely? Um, Riz, can you cheer me up on this? Is there any reason for optimism? <laughs> <laughs> Travis is usually the optimism guy. Um, I just don't understand what's the – What's the angle here? Uh, that's that's what has me confused. I mean, I understand ESPN obviously has um, a, a large amount of subscribers, and you know a lot of people are going to obviously tune in. But you have to have known by signing that and, and knowing who you know Wilder's aligned with someone else and Joshua's aligned with someone else that um, the the ability to make a fight between those two would obviously be very difficult. Um, so I, I don't understand the direction to go here. I, I don't know if this is just theory, just I, I think Fury is just kind of emphasizing a point that he's the one who's calling the shots. I don't know if that's the case here, but um, I don't know what this does, to be honest. I mean, it's just, it's more of a shock move and it's a, it's a co-agreement. So, I mean, what does that mean? Does that mean it will be showcased on ESPN in America and something else in, in, in Europe? I don't, I don't know. I don't get it. it. It would be a pay-per-view and I mean, you can definitely do a Showtime ESPN pay-per-view. I can see, how it's you know it's possible to do, but um, I don't know. This this just seems a, a questionable move, and I, I don't see the benefit of it yet. Uh, I'm not saying there is there isn't one. I mean, they're obviously using for Frank Warren to sign, you know, something with ESPN um, and Bob Arum. So there is a there is a there is a direction. I just don't get what it is yet, and we're hoping we will see it because um, you know I, I think if not, I think there's a good chance we won't see any of the meaningful heavyweight fights for a really long time. Uh, because Wilder and Joshua are no, not anywhere closer. And if ESPN has an issue dealing with the zone, which I think they very well might be, and an issue dealing with um, with Showtime, which is also a possibility, what fights are we going to see? And and we we all know that the, the division is very top three or four heavy. After that, those other guys just don't belong. 
Um, yeah. and, and we saw that, you know, Wilder's biggest win, one of them, is against Bermain Stavern, and obviously this guy is, he, he's gone, and, and Joey Joyce is, you know, he still has a while to go too. So there's there's a lot of, um, you know, the, the, I don't know if we've hit an impasse yet, but I just don't see what was the point of this. But I, again, I'm not, you know, I'm not a promoter, um, but I'm hoping that they see some reason for doing this. I guess we'll find out soon enough. Yeah, it seems like Fury's the odd man out here. Um, Travis, do you have a take on this at all? Uh, say that again, Dennis. Do you have Do you have a take on on this uh, this mess? <laughs> oh my God! I mean, you know, as much as you know, we like to love the Tyson Fury story right now after the Deontay Wilder uh, fight, by all means, Tyson, Tyson. This is this seems to be right up Tyson Fury's alley, meaning that he likes to. He likes to be weird. He likes to be different. He likes to do things on his own terms. And I think that's what he's proving to us right now that he doesn't want a situation or a situation to any of himself. So he just had to complicate it a little more. This makes sense if you're Bob Arum because Bob Arum wants to get involved in probably one of the two biggest, you know, grossing heavyweight fights out there, which is a, a rematch with Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury. And then a massive uh, fight with Anthony Joshua would be just huge for a Bob Arum. Even a co-promotion with that would be so huge. So I really do get where Bob Arum's coming from. I mean, he's always thinking about money, and we know that. Bob Arum knows how to make money. He knows how to sell fights, and he's always done it. Whether I very rarely agree with Bob Arum, but at the end of the day, uh, Bob Arum is talented enough and he's smart enough that Bob Arum does what he wants and we all pretty much fall in line eventually. So I think Bob Arum's at that point as well. Um, I'm wondering though, Tyson Fury has a record and obviously have mental health issues, self-admitted by him. I'm just wondering if this just is another way for him to demolish another fight because when he beat Klitschko, he kind of went off the rails after that, and we never even got to see a rematch. So now, he pretty much, in our eyes, won the biggest fight of his career, even though he didn't get the decision against Wilder, but we all thought he won. Um, and now it seems like he, he's doing everything he can to kind of crush that rematch, if you want to say that, because by all means, we thought this fight was done. I thought they had a, a date for like May 18th, I believe. And we thought it was signed, ready to go, and then boom. Now we have this. Oh, my co promoter is Bob Allen of ESPN. Whoops, did we lose you, Travis? I think we might have lost you. Okay. This is the Ringside Hello. Boxing Show from Monterey, California. I'm Dennis Taylor. We're talking to our expert analyst, Travis Hartman, Rizwan Zahid, and the fight lawyer is with us today, uh, Danny Saratelli, who we don't get to talk to on this show very often. Uh, Danny, um, I wanted to get your two cents on a couple of big fights that are on the horizon. Sure. Hey, what, Dennis, what? can I backtrack? Can I backtrack hey, one ahead. second? Sure. Yeah, go I, ahead. I just wanted to ask the guys what they thought about my boy Paulie Malignaggi in the gal's corner. I, it looked like he was just there and they were paying him no mind. <laughs> I thought he was giving good advice. I said, I hope he's getting paid uh, by the, the gal team, you know, to not be commentating the fight because I know he had to lose money. You know, that was one thing. Another thing, just to comment, uh, I like you, Ben. <laughs> but anyway, what were you going to go on to? Uh, oh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, all right. Um, okay. Yeah, I wanted to get your your take on what's going to happen when Mikey Garcia goes up two weight divisions to fight Errol Spence on March 16th, number one. And number two, what do you expect from Bud Crawford's fight with Amir Khan on April 20th? Okay. Um, well, uh you know, like uh, I like Travis's attitude, and I like some of these guys' attitudes. I mean, Mikey Garcia wants to fight the best. It, I mean, it's hard to find somebody that will pick Mikey Garcia to win the fight. Uh, I always, you know, I like to go with the underdog. I don't usually favor the slip. Uh, I feel like everybody favors since Floyd came around, and even the judges. I feel like everybody favors the slicker guy, and not so much the aggressor and the the guy who likes to mix it up. Um, not to say that that's going to happen in that fight. I, I like Mikey's attitude. I don't think his brother does or anybody else. I think it's going to be a really uphill battle and a really tough fight. He's pretty much outgunned in every way. But um, the guys I know that have been in the gym with Mikey uh, 
and you know all the top guys around. They all tell me a lot of this but at the lower weight classes that Mikey was the best guy they've ever been in the ring with. Yep, I've heard so, that. So, um, so I mean, you know, you have to give him that. And uh, Crawford, I'm excited to see Crawford coming to Madison Square Garden. I'd rather see him with a lot of other guys than uh, Amir Khan. But I think Amir Khan will be in a fight with anybody until he gets caught, you know. <laughs> so uh, I, I think Crawford, uh, I'm dying to see Crawford in there with the other. I'd love to see Crawford with Spence or with Garcia, the other, you know, Danny Garcia or Thurman or somebody like that since he moved up. I'm dying to see him in with one of the top guys or even um, Porter, and you know. There's a lot of fights to be made that they're not making. Okay, and and uh, throw that that question about Malinaji at Rizwan. See what he's got to say about that. <laughs> yeah, let me hear what he has to say. Riz, how you doing, buddy? I'm good. Can you repeat the question? Sorry, I missed it. I was just saying, I, I don't know the background and everything. I actually didn't tune in. I didn't even know Paulie was going to be in the gal's corner until I turned it on. But I was saying, I saw Paulie yelling stuff out, and it looked like they paid no mind to him over there. I was curious if you knew. Uh, I, I didn't know he was working the corner. If you knew uh, what was going on. I, I, I had no idea he funny. was either. That's that's very strange. Um, I don't know. It's weird trying to transition from commentator to corner person. But, um, I mean, Paulie doesn't really do that. I, I'm not Paulie's about good. That, but, I think if he would have uh, listened to Paulie, he would have did better. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, usually listening, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't understand what's, yeah, why you have a guy in your corner if you're not going to. And this is what, this is one of those things where we, we've talked about before. Having too many voices in a corner is not a good thing. Um, we all thought True. it was weird when, when Tyson Fury hired Freddie Roach as one of his corner men. We thought we knew we knew how Roach's ego is. We know he wasn't going to be the third person uh, to kind of follow instructions. So we knew that was that was going to. Oh, did we lose you now, Riz? I might have lost Riz one too. Yeah. Did we? Can you hear me? Oh, uh, yeah, there you go. Okay, now we can cut. we got okay. you now. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I was just saying, you know, on corners just doesn't work, right? Um, there's too many there's eagles at play, and that's something you can't really forget. I'm sure Paul is just trying to get in a word in edgewise, but um, yeah, you didn't have to. He's usually, there's three or four. He's usually good there. at that too. Yeah, he was just yelling. I mean, I just thought it was a little weird. And to the gal, I was at that Bodo Jack fight, and. Uh, I remember I bet the fight. I don't remember which way I bet it, actually. It was weird, but I, I was with, you know, whenever you go to a fight, I don't know about the West Coast, but I know on the East Coast, anytime there's a, a British guy fighting, there's, there's, you know, I saw Joe Calzaghe in the garden, or I saw the gal in uh, Brooklyn. There's more of them at the fight, usually, than there is Americans. Like, they come deep uh, when I saw, you know, a lot of the guys. And they were telling me that the gal, I went to the bathroom in the beginning of the fight, and they told me he always boxes sharp for the first half of the fight and fades late. And I felt like he, he, for the first six rounds, like if I remember correctly, I felt like he pretty much swept Jack. And then he just went like he did last night. He just got defensive, was holding, running, and trying to survive and coast and thinking he already had the fight won. And the the end of the fight last night, the weirdest part to me was when the fight ended because the gal act like he won, was going nuts celebrating. And I thought he spoke about himself like you had mentioned earlier, like way too much like he's 90 years old and like he accomplished even more than what he has. <laughs> and uh, and Eubanks looked like he thought he lost, and he was pissed off. Even when they announced him the winner, he didn't look happy. <laughs> but he, he got a good body slam, and you know, that's why I like Eubanks. I like his, I like his attitude. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, one more for you guys, and this is another edition uh, on the Ringside Boxing Show of... What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? All right, uh, British, uh, a British tabloid uh, published uh, Valentine's Day photos of Ricky Hatton, one of which showed his, his uh, face in a ball gag, uh, and the other showed his pasty bare butt in, in thong underwear, which, uh, uh, while he was apparently handcuffed and getting spanked, according to him. Um, and the punchline is that Hatton apparently provided these photos himself, and he called it the best Valentine's present ever. So... Um, Riz, I, I guess this makes it more Im- amusing than embarrassing, unlike uh, De La Hoya's lingerie pics, doesn't it? I have no idea, man. He's... British humor is very different. I like every, you know, I talked to a, a British friend of mine at work after, and I told him the story, and he thought it was the funniest thing he's ever heard. 
this is just, I don't know. This is they're they're They just appreciate different things as humor. So, um, <laughs> I don't know. All I hope is more than anything else. I hope Ricky Adams, like, cause I remember he had a serious drug problem after he retired. I hope that's not the case here. And I hope it's just, uh, I guess your day-to-day British humor, <laughs> if that's the case. And uh, I, I just hope he's okay more than anything else. But uh, I mean, uh, yeah, that's 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 something that's only in boxing, right? You, you'll never see a former, you don't see so many, so too many other former NFL stars or or basketball stars or something getting in a story like this. You'll see some weird stories, but this one's, uh, yeah, this one, this one's unique. It's, this is a, I mean, Ricky Hatton is a pretty unique guy, but this is up there with one of the most unique stories I've heard in a while. Yeah. It, uh... Danny, I, I could see Tyson Fury doing something like this down the road, though, couldn't you? <laughs> Absolutely. I could totally see it. I was just wondering, was he Ricky Hatton or Ricky Fatten in those pictures? Because I didn't see him. You know? He looked pretty tight. Yeah, he looked, <laughs> he looked like he was in shape. His, his butt did. It, didn't look, it, wasn't, it wasn't an enormous butt. Like you know. <laughs> I'll tell you, to this day, I'm pissed off at De La Hoya because I argued with people like a maniac that the pictures I, – I used to hire the round girls, the round court girls for the fights in Jersey for years, and I was used to going through pictures and how bad they could be photoshopped and how good of a job they could do. So I argued with a million people as far as that De La Hoya was photoshopped into those pictures. And when he admitted to it, I felt like beating him up, up personally because I was like, come on, Oscar, that's something you don't admit to ever. <laughs> I don't, you know, but yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, that's Travis Hartman, Rizwan Zahid, and the fight lawyer Danny Saratelli sitting in this week for John J. Responti. Hey, Danny, great fun to have you on this show again. Thanks a lot, my friend. Thank you, Dan. It's always a pleasure. All right, uh, everybody, have a great week, and uh, um, we're going to move on here. Uh, John Responti is going to rejoin me after a very quick break, and we'll be talking to a true boxing legend, Hall of Famer and six-time world champion Michael Carbajal. We've been trying to track this guy down for a very long time, uh, and that's straight ahead, so do not touch that dial. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Ringside Boxing Show, the hottest, sweatiest show on West Coast Radio. (laughs) What are you doing? Hi, I'm Dennis Taylor, host of the Ringside Boxing Show, where since 2008 we have been continuously sponsored by Garcia Boxing, the first family of the sweet science on California's beautiful Central Coast. Trainers Max and Sam Garcia and ring strategist Dean Hamilton are regarded among the most knowledgeable in the game. And Kathy Garcia, who manages all Garcia Boxing fighters, is renowned for her integrity and career guidance having taken two boxers to number one world rankings. Together they comprise one of the most respected teams in the sport. Learn more by calling 831-261-3214 or send them an email at GarciaBoxing25 at AOL.com. I'm Dennis Taylor, co-author of the Amazon bestseller Intimate Warfare, the true story of the Arturo Gatti and Mickey Ward boxing trilogy. You know, writing this book was a labor of love for John J. Responti and myself. We enjoyed every minute of the process and considered it a privilege to tell the tale of one of the most electrifying boxing trilogies in the history of this sport. Intimate Warfare traces the collision course of Arturo Gatti and Mickey Ward from their earliest days through their three epic fights as well as the aftermath of this great rivalry which culminated in one of the greatest friendships in boxing. Intimate Warfare has received a four and a half star rating from readers and was endorsed by Hall of Famers Harold Letterman and Joe Cortez and two-time trainer of the year Virgil Hunter. Our foreword was written by Ray Boom Boom Mancini, another one of the greatest blood and guts fighters of our time. Get your copy today at Amazon.com. I hope you're enjoying this one because this is what it's all about as Carvajal tries to put together a combination. Again, he scores in the left, and he backs up Gonzalez into the road. He's got him hurt here in round seven. Carvajal Hall has come all the way back. He's got Gonzalez hurt as he slipped across the ring. A leg weakening underneath him with over a minute to go here in round seven. Carvajal Hall has Gonzalez hurt. Carvajal Hall down twice in this fight has come all the way back. Scoring a big left hand to the chin of Chiquita Gonzalez. Oh, my. Oh, my. Again, they go toe-to-toe in the center of the ring. And Carvajal with another combination. 
another combination. He rocks the WBC champ, the IBF champ, in control here in round seven. His combination working. He tries to finish with a big left and just misses. Carvajal inside the phone booth. It hasn't been kind. And now the chance of Michael. Michael. Boy, what a war. What a war. Unbelievable. Carvajal. Rocky Gonzalez, and he can't put him away here in the seventh round. Final 20 seconds. Again he scores. And another big right to the head. Another left. And he's got Gonzalez hurt. And he's down. He's got Gonzalez down. He's got any can't be saved by the bell. Carvajal thinks he's got it won. It appears he's got it won. He can't be saved by the bell. It's all over. It's all over. It's all over. Michael Carvajal came all the way back to knock him out in the seventh round. He is the unified WBC and IBF champion. Michael Carvajal. Unbelievable. The seventh round knockdown. Gonzalez being escorted off. Oh, baby. You have seen a war. Two times Michael knocks to the canvas. He responds. He comes back and knocks Gonzalez up here in the seventh round at the Las Vegas Hilton. Bob Arum hugging him. Chiquita Gonzalez, the left eye nearly closed. He appears to be all right. This has been a wild ride. Oh, baby. Oh, baby. Welcome back to the Ringside Boxing Show on the Grueling Truth Sports Network. I'm Dennis Taylor with John J. Responti, and we are about to talk to one of the greatest fighters of all time, International Boxing Hall of Famer Michael Carvajal, Manitas de Piedra, Little Hands of Stone, who went 49-4 and with 33 knockouts during a career that spanned from 1989 to 1999, during which he won the WBO, IBF, and WBC world title belts, all in the light flyweight division. He was a six-time world champion. Michael Carbajal was the Ring Magazine's Fight of the Year in 1993 when he knocked out Humberto Chiquita Gonzalez in the seventh round, and he was the Ring's Comeback Fighter of the Year in 1999 when he took the WBO title away from 20-year-old Jorge Arce. Uh, Carbajal retired right after that fight. Not, not often that a legendary fighter retires with a world title belt and goes out on top. Michael, welcome to the Ringside Boxing Show. Thanks very much for for giving us some of your time today. How are you, sir? Good. How are you guys doing, Dennis and John? Doing great. Yeah, great. Well, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, great to have you. Michael, you, uh, you were still a young man, uh, two months short of your 32nd birthday, in fact, when you walked away from the ring as a world champion after beating Jorge Arce in, in the the sixth world title fight, actually it was about the 20th world title fight, but the sixth world championship of your career. Walking away from the bright lights, not to mention a lot of money, is, is a, a really difficult thing for most elite fighters. Why were you ready to retire at that point? Because I, I had that um, ever since I was a little kid. I've always um, told my father, which I didn't know, but I, I've always told him that <clears throat> um that I wanted to be a world champion and retire a world champion. And um, that's what um, had me say, you know what, this is enough. I mean, I almost lost to uh, to Arsip because he was ahead on points. And I, and I um, once I um, knocked him out, I said, that's it for me. I'm retiring world champion. I'm not going to be like the, like the rest of the legendary fighters that just stood um, too long. Any regrets about that? Are you are you happy that you did it the way you did it? Oh, I'm very happy. No no regrets at all. It was very very difficult to um to really do that because I love boxing so much. I miss it to this day, believe me. I miss it. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, we we believe you. Yeah, you'd won four world title belts before that, so the experience wasn't new, but I think you had decided, I think we read you had decided beforehand that the our safe fight was going to be it for you, right? Was that the most rewarding win of your career? It was. Um, it was. Um, you know, there's a couple of fights that are really rewarding that I can mention, but um, it was very rewarding. I mean, that that last fight, 
And now, as the years pass passed on, it even makes it more rewarding because you know I had told Arthur because he was in the dressing room and he was really sad and he was crying. And I went to the to his dressing room and I told him, you know what, Arthur, don't worry about it because you will become champion again. And he did, and he even did more than what I thought he was going to do, and he won four four more world titles after that. Mm. So it was very rewarding. Yeah, that fight was in Tijuana on RC's home turf. Uh, did it feel like, did the Mexican crowd give you any love that night? Uh, did you feel the crowd was mixed, or, or were they pretty much going for RC? Oh, it was definitely for Arce. Um mm-hmm. But, you know, after the fight, um, they were throwing beers and everything. And But afterwards, like like totally when I hung out in Tijuana, oh, they were they were great. They they um they gave me a lot of love. Nice. You know, Michael, what some fans might not remember is that you lost your IBA title uh two years earlier to Jacob Madlala, uh, a guy yes. from South Africa who had eleven losses and two draws on his record, but he was a tough fighter. He he had been a, yeah. a IBF and WBO flyweight champ and a WBO light flyweight champ previously. Um you got stopped on cuts in the ninth round against him. And then we didn't see you again for 19 months. How difficult was that time for you, those 19 months? And at what point did you decide that you were going to make another run at the brass ring? Well, because I, what I've always said, I, man, I can't go out like this. Um, yeah. And that was a very difficult fight to go out like that because um, it was it was very difficult. You know, I just took some time off and I said, you know what, I'm going to come back, win a world title, and – retire and um it was very difficult uh, throughout that whole year that i was gone so um i just wanted to come back and win a world title and that was it you know i remember during that broadcast uh or maybe your, it was your first world title fight keith jackson the great sports caster said that you had learned to box in an old chicken coop behind your house is that really a true story yeah, that's a that's a very true story. Really? It was, it, yeah, I was a tin it was a tin shed garage, and um, that's where I worked out. Oh my God! I had a bag, one speed bag, um, an uppercut bag outside, and a double in bag outside, and that was it. And I had a ten by ten ring for sparring. That, you know, uh, and I want to remind people that you're from Phoenix. Man, it must have been hot sometimes. <laughs> it was like 100. <laughs> See, that's why I'm used to the heat. It was like, a, and I love the heat, believe me. Um, it was like 120 degrees during the Ju- June, July, August. I mean, it got up to 120 degrees. But yeah, I love well, it. Yeah. You were in the shade under that tin, though. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but it made it it made it hotter in there because of the tin. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Really? yeah. Gosh. Like yeah, Michael, we, were, oh, we remember you. We remember you so well as an amateur fighter, and 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 you were ninety four and nine. God, you were such a good amateur, national Golden Gloves champ in eighty six, U.S. amateur champ in eighty eight, and you were on the nineteen eighty eight Olympic team that went to to South Korea. You came home with a silver silver medal. Was that satisfying, or were you a little disappointed? I was very, very satisfied. It was very, I was very satisfied. Um, a lot of people thought I won the the gold medal round. It was a very close fight. Yep. Um, and I thought I won the I I thought I won the fight, but I was very happy with the silver. I mean, just to represent. United States of America at the Olympics. That was very satisfying. What was it like? Did you know that, that medal home? Hang on, just yeah. uh, just a second, Joe. What was it like bringing that medal home to Phoenix? That was great. I mean, there were so many people in in the neighborhood where I still live at, right here on Fillmore and Ninth Street, and um, everything was blocked off. There were so many people. I was like. Whoa! It was it was wild. It was great. 
Did you, Michael, did you know at that point you were going to turn pro? Was that already predetermined in your mind, or were you still thinking about it? No, that was predetermined. That was the, ever since I started boxing, that's what I've always wanted. I didn't, I didn't even think about the Olympics or the Pan American Games or any of that. I just kept fighting until um, I knew I was going to turn pro, no matter what had happened. And because um, that's that was my goal in the in the first place is to become a world champion as a professional. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, back to that team for a minute that you were on. It was such a great team with Kennedy McKinney and Andrew Maynard and Ray Mercer, who won a gold, and, and, and Riddick Bowe, Roy Jones, got a silver. Uh, yes. What do you remember? Is there anything – I'm sure you remember a lot about it, but is there anything that really stands out about being part of that group and, and, and boxing then? Well, it was, um, it, was a great, it was a great time. I mean, all of us. I mean, you're, you're talking about it's probably one of the greatest um, teams in, um, in, in the history of the Olympics, boxing-wise. Oh, yes. Yep. And, yes. um, and we, are, we are very proud of that. We, we always say we're the best because we got the most medals. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, you could have had two more golds, too, because Roy Jones got screwed, you know, famously, oh. and, and you Whoa. probably won your fight. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's one, two, three, four, five. It would have been six gold medalists if you guys and had then won. And then we had a couple of bronze medalists, too. Yeah, Romelis Ellis yeah. and Kenny Gould got bronze Kenny Gould. there. Right. Yeah. What an amazing team. What an amazing there. team. Hey, what do you remember about walking around the Olympic Village? Was that pretty cool, walking around seeing the other athletes, Nadia oh, Komenich and everybody? All all of them. I mean, it was it was great. You know, meeting Flo Joe. Um, hmm. all, all the track stars, I mean, like, you're like, whoa, you know, we're, we're right here at the Olympics with everybody. It, it was unbelievable. You think about it way back at the time where uh, it's like, oh, man, look at this. You know, we, we'll just talk about it and just talk about this person or that person, this athlete. And, and it was, it was, a, it was a wild ride. Did you get to see much of Seoul, South Korea, or were you just kind of uh, stuck in the village well, the whole time? Most of the time, at at that time, it, um, we were stuck in the village most of the time, just you know, going through all, um, just meeting all the athletes from all over. Yeah. But see, I had went to Korea in '87 to Seoul, mm-hmm. so I got to. Tell them about AK1, and you know that's a big, big. Um, it's like one of the main streets in 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 Seoul. So I've been there before, and I was telling everybody, man, I wish we can go to AK1, which we did. We did. We didn't get to go like everybody wanted to go, because we're getting all kinds of all kinds of um, you know clothing, you know different. You know, like they were making Gucci and all this, you know, all the name clothes. You know, I was never, I mean, we were getting that for cheap. You're talking about $5 for, for a sweatsuit or a Adidas sweatsuit, Fila, um, all kinds of, all kinds of uh, name brand sweatsuits, clothes, everything for not more than $5. And we send it back home. We'll buy all kinds of clothes. And send him home. It was wow. it was wild. Michael, yeah. did you get to travel a lot as an amateur uh, worldwide? I mean, did you see a lot of the world as an amateur fighter, or was Korea kind of the the one place? I went I went to um, Cuba, Yugoslavia, and France. Wow! Wow! Man, and it probably made you grow up fast as a as a eighteen <laughs> nineteen year old kid. Yeah. Oh yeah, it did. It, it helped out a lot. Believe me, it gave yeah. me a whole lot of experience. So um, it, it helped a great deal. So you, you won your first title, uh, the IBF light flyweight belt, in July of 1990 in your hometown, Phoenix, with a seventh-round knockout of this guy, Mong Che Kitty Kasim, 
And, uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he, he was an undefeated guy from, from Thailand who was the reigning world champ. And you finished him uh, right at the start of the seventh round with a right uppercut, followed by a left uppercut, and, and he just crumpled. Um, what do you remember about him, and, and what are your memories of that fight and winning that first world title? You know what? Nobody doesn't know this, but he was he was a whole lot tougher than Chiquita. Really? Oh man, this guy could punch. Huh. This guy, he is the hardest puncher. He had skills, and he was a big hundred. He was a big uh, junior flyweight. He wasn't small, and um, that that boy could punch. And I I always told that. If, in every interview, who was your toughest fight? I said, it had to be Chiquita and, and Kitty Kasem. But who was tougher? And I said, well, I have to give the nod to Kitty Kasem. Wow. Huh. wow. Was he the biggest puncher you ever faced? Kitty Kasem was the hardest puncher, yes. The what? hardest, hardest puncher. puncher, I mean, that I ever faced. His jab was unbelievable. I mean, he jabbed out like a right hand. Every time he hit me with that jab, I was, my head was popped way back. I was going, God, damn, I got to get rid of this guy. <laughs> it was, it, he was a very tough fighter. But see, yeah. he only had he only had like 10 or 12 fights. I had 15. And, you know, the IBF, I think, was very, I, it was a, a new title at the time. Right, and uh, and he, but what he did have, you know, why he had a lot of experience because he had like forty something, forty forty something, white tie fights before mm. he, he went to boxing. Wow. Yeah, he he um he uh, he he moved up in weight too and won another title after after I beat him. Huh. Wow. So he was he's he was a tough guy. Real tough. But Chiquita ever, like Chiquita I'm he was call. tough too because he, he dropped me twice. That's the only yeah. time in my whole career, amateur and professional, I've ever got dropped. Yeah, let's talk about that fight for a minute. You by my count you successfully defended that IBF title nine times. And and yeah. then you added the, the WBC lightweight fl- light flyweight belt along the way. So uh, you, you get Humberto Ch- Chiquita Gonzalez in 1993, and you won by a seventh round knockout, um, and, and that was the ring's fight of the year. What do you remember about that night and that fight? Uh, you, you got off the deck twice in the fifth round, right? Yes, I got I got knocked down. It was pretty much a flash knockdown in the second round. And then in the fifth round, he hit me with the beautiful right hook. I mean, right on the money. And I went down and I said, whoa. I just knew I was down. I hit the canvas. And when I got up, I said, man, he's going to come right straight after me. I was still wobbly. My legs were still not, I was still wobbly. But once, once I found my leg, because one of my legs, I could feel the canvas. The other one was still a little shaky. Once I thought that, I said, that's it. I got him now. And, and then I knocked him wow. out a couple of rounds later. Yeah, and yeah. afterwards, you, you went to the corner, and your brother Danny was was a little bit uh, worried about you. What What did you say to Danny at that moment? I said, don't worry. I said, don't worry. <laughs> I have him. Don't worry. Don't worry. That's all I said. Don't even worry about it. He goes, okay, 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 I trust you. I said, you just don't worry about it. Wow. Gosh, don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, he won the rematch by majority decision a year later in Mexico mm-hmm. City, uh, Michael. That was the first loss of no, your that career. Was, uh, I'm sorry. Um, that was a, that was in, in L.A., the forum. Oh, 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 oh okay. okay. That was a second. That. Yeah, that was a second. L.A. Yeah. That was okay. the chicken fight. Now that was fight, that, uh-huh. go ahead. I totally thought I won that fight. Mm. Totally, but you know that was his home crowd. Believe it or not, mm-hmm. even though it was here in the USA, 
But over there at the forum, they had a big Mexican fan base there, and all the Mexicans fought there. So. Yeah. Yeah. So he had yeah. he had a he had a big fan base out there too. But I I so, thought I wanted to fight. Yeah, so I was going to ask you about that. Why do you think you won? Did you did you do more than him? Because I I remember it vaguely, he, but I don't remember it as well. Like yeah. You, did you, did you, so I you I more. put. Yeah, I put so much pressure on him, and I was landing all the hardest shots. He was moving mm-hmm. around, which everybody was surprised. He didn't. He didn't fight like the first time. Mm-hmm. He he stood away from me, and you know what? He, I give him credit for that, because he knew that he wasn't gonna he wasn't gonna be able to stand there and punch with me. There was no way. He knew that from the first fight, so he got a little smart and started boxing. And he was mm-hmm. moving around a lot, so I I give him a whole lot of credit for that. Mm-hmm. He was mm-hmm. he was smart he was a smart fighter, and um, he won a he won it was a split decision, mm-hmm. and I said man, what was I what was I supposed to do I was still I still thought I wanted to fight but I was you know disappointed, but I said mm-hmm. it's okay I'll just come back and beat them the next time. Mm. I see. Was there yeah, ever any thought fought. about a trilogy? Was there a chance you might have fought him again? Yeah, we did. A third time? Yeah, we fought a third time in Mexico oh, okay. City. Mm-hmm. That's, That's what I'm it. thinking of. Yeah, okay. Yeah, All but right. that was... See, the first two was, was with Bob Arum and the Forum. The The third one was with Don King. And, and mm. I don't know um, if Chiquita still had the Forum. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Um, promoting him, but I was through Don King Promotions mm-hmm. in Mexico right. City. Mm. Yeah, you fought so many tough guys, Michael. Of your 53 pro fights, uh, this was mentioned earlier, but it's incredible. 20 were world title bouts. Here's a good question for you. Who was the best fighter you ever fought? <laughs> I should say Kid of Cases. Phil, I thought yeah. you might say that. Really? Skill wise too, huh? It, it, in terms of skill, also skill. In terms, yes. I mean, he was. Wow. He, I mean, he was a hard puncher. He had, I mean, the greatest jab. That's why he was so good. Because that's what sets everything up. Is his jab was so so powerful. And and then. Yeah. Um, and just not that he he was very skilled. Mm-hmm. When you look so back at I the people who was. worked with you um, over throughout your career, who, who shaped you as a fighter? Who, who do you think of as the as the guy who taught you to fight? My father. Your dad. Mm-hmm. My father taught me ever since I was five years old, because I always told him I wanted to fight, and he he wouldn't let me. At that time. During the amateur days, you could fight at six years old. Now, you know, it's raised up to eight years old. You can't as amateurs. And I, I've always wanted to fight, but he wouldn't let me. Hmm. You just wait till you get older. And then till about 13, 14, um, Danny, my now estranged brother, built the gym in the back. Mm-hmm. In that tin gym in the back, and um, that's where it started. Hmm. What kind of fighter was, was your dad? Was your dad a fighter? Yeah, yeah my dad was a fighter. Um, he he, uh, he only had he had like about I don't know twenty something fights as an amateur. Won the state Golden Gloves in nineteen. 19- 30s, I believe, 40s, somewhere, somewhere mm-hmm. around there. And um, he told me that my grandmother didn't let him turn pro, but I don't know mm-hmm. the whole story. So that's what happened with him. But he's the one that taught me everything. Mm-hmm. I mean, like all the basics and how to punch and how to everything else, how to duck and stay away. But he always taught me professionally 
like professional style wise. Mm-hmm. What everybody mm-hmm. told me that he that's what that's what he was, and they called him Cobra. Cobra. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So um, he he taught me a whole lot from the beginning. I love it. Yeah. Okay, was there anybody who you really wanted to fight but never got the chance? Well, of course, Ricardo Lopez. Yeah. Ah. That's what we thought you'd say. (laughs) I've always wanted to fight him. Always. But it just never um, materialized. Well, Mm -hmm. see, it um, it would have had I would have won in Mexico City. If I would have beat Chiquita in that third fight, because... Ricardo Lopez fought on the undercard of the fight. So if me and Lopez would have won, Lopez won, I didn't win. So the fight never materialized. That's the only reason that's the only reason that um we went to Don King. Mm. What because, kind of fight do you think that would have been if you had fought Lopez? Yeah. I think I would have stopped them in about seven or eight rounds. You know I'm not going to say mm-hmm. I, I would have lost. <laughs> right. <laughs> you, know, I, you know that already. No, I just say by style-wise, because of the fact he had a, a great he had great boxing skills. He was my height. I had great boxing skills. I was a lot quicker than he was, and my punches were a lot sharper and shorter than he than he, his was. So that's why I believe that I would have beat him within about mm-hmm. seven rounds. Was a, was making weight ever a challenge for you at 108? No, not at all. Not whatsoever. Huh. Maybe, maybe, off- maybe a couple of fights, you know, later on. But that's it. That I had a, um, I had a, a little bit of a problem making weight, but not not like a real bad problem because you know what I, I never, I was walking around one fifteen, one fourteen. Once I start training, it was nothing. I'd be at a hundred nine. I stay there all the time, between, between, say one eight and one ten. Once I started training, but if I wasn't training, then I'd, I'd walk around 115 pounds. You and uh, you and Chiquita went into the International Boxing Hall of Fame together in 2006. What kind of a day was that for you? Oh, unbelievable. I mean, when they called me, I just about cried. Hmm. And they said, Michael, you're, you'll be inducted into the... Boxing Hall of Fame, and I just said, "Whoa, really?" I said, "Great," and I, I just about, I was teary-eyed. So, so that came as a surprise to you that they were going to put you in the Hall of Fame? Of course, <laughs> yes, it did. I uh, mean, as a okay. when I, because during the time, I mean, you know. It was a surprise for me, but when I look back at it now, but, you know, at that time, oh, yes, it was very, it was very surprising. That's why I was teary up. Yeah, yeah. I get I that guess. part. Um, yeah. What's it like What's it like for you today to walk around Phoenix and, and be my, Michael Friggin Carbajal? <laughs> <laughs> you get a lot of love, um, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. yes. Everywhere. I mean, everywhere I go, uh, I really, it's not like, you know, they, they, um, like, how do you say that? Like a whole lot of people, it's not like they just surround me. At the beginning of it, you know, there's few people now, you know, they still, they still come up to me. Oh, Michael, can I take a picture with you? Can I, everywhere I go. I said, sure, no problem. 
I'm still a very humble guy. I never, never changed at all, whatsoever. I, I still live in the same neighborhood, same house, everything. And uh, and you own a gym there that's actually right across the street from from the house you, where you grew up, right? Yes, yes. And nice. Yeah. Yeah. How much you enjoy coaching kids? I just got out of the gym. Matter of fact, huh, <laughs> I love really? it. Really? I love it. <laughs> I love it. So teaching comes pretty easily for you, Michael. Oh yeah. If I if I can um, help someone be become a world champion, that'd be that'd be a great honor for me. Mm. I mean, just to help somebody if they if they want it, because I I always tell the kids because some of the you know the older kids like I have a couple of eight year olds. I don't I don't have too many of them. Because a lot of them like to play around a lot, and and they, um, you know, as you get older, you don't know what's going to happen. Maybe this kid, he's going to keep it up. Well, of course, I I like to do that, and I like to see the little kids, like the little eight year olds, like that. Um, they they just so happy, and they they're intrigued by it, but a lot of them don't really pay attention, <laughs> and they like to play. And I always tell the fathers, because I think a lot of the fathers make them, you know, like he wants to be a boxer. He wants. I said, sure, bring them on, bring them on. How old do they have to be? Because I have a five-year-old. I go, um, that's a little bit too young. Can you, like, you know, have them start like about 8 o'clock? I mean, eight years old. If they're um, at five years old, six years old, that's that's pretty hard. Cause I tried it once, and they were it was it was very difficult. Cause they still want to play. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> you know, you're a little kid. You you don't want to be in there hitting the bag and training and and doing that. But as an eight year old, it 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 changes a little bit because I have a couple of them in there, and they're really intrigued by it. So, and I can see that. So I'm happy to do that. That's great. Nice. <laughs> when, when you look at today's crop of fighters, who impresses you? Who do you like? My favorite is Mikey Garcia. Really? Mm. What do you think his, sh- his shot is against Fan- uh, Errol Spence going up so much in weight? Yeah. That's the only problem. Is because Spence is, is a bigger man, but I'll give you this though. I've I've watched I've never watched Earl Spence fight a, a whole fight of his, but I watch a lot of clippings and, and I watch a, a lot uh kind of like about four or five rounds of the Cal Brook fight, mm-hmm. and I. Just a few rounds of that. Earl Spence is very wide. He throws mm-hmm. very wide, and that's where Mikey's going to have his chance, because Mikey is very sh- he's a very sharp fighter, and I think he's going to surprise a lot of people and be as strong as Spence is. But we're we're going to have to see about that because Earl's not a bad fighter, but the way that he throws his punches, they're pretty wide. And I seen him against Cal Brook. He was getting hit a lot. It's just not like he just smothered Cal Brook. But that's why I give Mikey, I say Mikey wins by an upset because everybody thinks spent. And I know I'm biased because he's my favorite fighter, of course. Mm-hmm. But as skill wise, if Mikey, he's a better boxer than than Earl Spence is, and he sh- he throws a lot sharper. And when you're sharp like that, and you throw short short combinations like that, and and the way Spence throws wide, don't be surprised if Mikey knocks him out. 
Man, that would be a moment. That would be incredible. Yeah, yeah. yeah I will. <laughs> yeah, I will. Okay. But see, we always think about how big Earl is, Earl Spence is. Mm-hmm. See, that yeah. we're, we're going to find that out. That's the only but, that's the only thing that I see that um, Mikey will have a problem with. Yep, Mikey Garcia skill is wise, daring to be great. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Skill wise, I don't see Mikey having a problem, but I'm just saying bigness. But you know, there's a lot of small guys that have beat bigger guys. That the smaller guy is a lot skillful or as skilled as Earl Spence is, because Mikey is, the little guy wins. Mm-hmm. A whole lot of times that happened. Roberto Duran with Sugar Ray Leonard. Mm-hmm. And I give, I say that because that's another one where I'm biased, but I, I just showed, <laughs> it just showed because I'm a Roberto Duran fan. He's my idol, so. Yep. yep. He did it, so. We don't know, you know. It's it's a very it's very tough, but skill wise, I give it to Mikey. All right. Wow. Is is a uh, is this era of fighters on on a par with with the era that you fought in? Could 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 they compete? You know what? I think biased again. <laughs> no, no, no. That's why I'm not going to be biased at because okay. you know what? In every era that we have you always have great fighters yeah no matter what era it was and we can say you know like back in the days in the 80s and you know the 60s they talked about Sugar Ray Robinson Joe Lewis and all them guys and then you talk about the 80s and Sugar Ray Leonard Roberto Duran Tommy Hearns Marvin Hagler all them guys and then you talk about the 90s Whoever they are, you you all know who it is. Roy Besides Jones Besides me yep. and Roy Jones yep. and Riddick Bowe and, and yep. all of them. And and it's, it, I mean, we all have our eras of fighting. Yep. Um, so I, I can't, I can't, I can't say that. I mean, but you're always going to have somebody or plenty, plenty of champions that in their era, they're going to be the best. I, I can't say I'm the best or 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 than any flyweight of all time or anything. We don't know that because I never fought them guys before, before me. But I made an impact, though. You know that's what everybody tells me. Michael, you paved the way. You know how you know how good that feels. Yeah. I mean, all the fighters now. Nowadays, yep. they go, Michael, you paved the way for us lighter weights. Thank you. That makes me feel, that that's, that just makes me feel really good. That's an yeah. honor. So it makes yeah. me feel good. Tremendous. Michael Carbajal is truly one of the greatest fighters who ever lived. I'm going to say it if he won't. Uh, six world well, titles, 49-4, and four, Olympic silver medal, uh, Michael, I'm speaking for boxing fans all over the world when I say thanks for the memories, my friend. And uh, once again, thanks for making some time for us today on the Ringside Boxing Show. It's been a real okay. pleasure. Oh, thank you. It's been a pleasure, and I appreciate what you just said, okay? I really do. Thank you. Yep. You're so very welcome, nice. and thank you. Uh, and we would love to do this again someday. All right, let's okay. talk yeah. again. You guys take care, Dennis, John. Take care. All okay? right. All right. Yeah, great. The great uh-huh. Michael Carbajal, Manitas de Piedra, Little Hands of Stone, on the Ringside Boxing Show. Hey, do you like this show? Do us a solid. Tell other boxing fans about us. Post the Ringside Boxing Show on your sh- social media and help us grow. Our website, uh, ringsideboxingshow.com, has been down for a few days due to some technical difficulties. The hard drive on my computer crashed, and so the Geek Squad Hospital is uh, on it right now. Check back in a few days, and we'll have it back up again. Um, we want to uh, thank our, our expert analysts, Travis Hartman, Rizwan Zahid, and John J. Responti, and also uh, the fight lawyer, Danny Saratelli, who uh, sat in for uh, John J. Responti in today's first half of the show. Uh, 
Thanks also to our British correspondent, Paul McLaughlin, and of course a very special thanks to today's featured guest, the great Hall of Famer, Michael Carbajal on the Ringside Boxing Show. And uh, thanks also to you guys, Ringside Nation, for being a part of our worldwide audience again today. Keep your chin tucked, and we will talk to you again next week on the Ringside Boxing Show. Well, it's a great day for me to whoop somebody's ass. It's a bad day, so you better get off of my back. You might get cold, cock, if you cross my path. It's a great 